Today is the final question in this series of Jesus' frequently asked questions. And these questions, although Jesus was specifically talking to the disciples or at times the crowds, they're just as relevant for us today. And I want to just encourage you, if you've not been able to join with us in the earlier parts of this series, that you go back and uh, watch them and catch up on the entire series. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at another question, but we began this series out with the question that Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And we looked at that question and I challenged you on that day to consider for yourselves, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? And we came to the conclusion that in all logical kind of sense that there are three options for that. Jesus was either he was a liar and he was just an ordinary man with a big ego, or he was a crazy man, a lunatic, and uh, he thought he was God and acted like he was God, but he really wasn't God. Or the third option, which we concluded was really the only one that made sense, was that he really is the Son of God. And him being the Son of God means that we need to be listening to him. And I want you today to consider that question even for yourself. If you've never considered what it means or who Jesus is to you and what that means, then you ask that of yourself. Who is Jesus? What difference would he make or could he make in my life? And the only answer that I am sure that you will come to the same conclusion, the only answer that will make sense in that is that Jesus is the Son of God. And as such, we need to listen to him. Next, we looked at the second question, do you now believe? And in that question, we spoke about the evidence of God's glory and his love and, the, and power in our society. And even though we began this series before the COVID-19 began or the restrictions began, I want us to recognize that the opportunity that has become available to us now to proclaim the message of God to this nation and beyond. It's his control is over all that is happening. Jesus is still in control. And I have continually been reminded that God is able to, is willing to, and is able to use what could be on what seems to be a bad situation for good. God has the power to use what is intended for evil and use it for good. He did it in the process of Jesus's uh, trial and his crucifixion and he, in the death part of that. It was not a good situation for the disciples or any of those that trusted in Jesus at that time, yet God took what was intended for evil and made it into or used it for good. If ever there was a time to place our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe it is today. Pastor Jasmine led us through the third question, which was, do you want to get well? And in that we examined the evidence of our society and realized that not everyone actually wants to be made spiritually well. In fact, not everyone even realizes that they're spiritually sick. But we have an opportunity and we need to recognize that we are spiritually sick and we are in need of being made well at this time. After all, many of us go to a doctor when we're sick, but the problem with society is why would we even go to a doctor if we don't know that we're sick in the first place? The reality is that we've been blinded to the spiritual healing that is needed in our own lives, that this world, the God of this world has restricted our thinking. And so the question that uh, Pastor Jasmine was sharing with us on that day was, do you want to be made well? Do you want spiritual healing in your life today? Say yes to that. And I know that God will use and you and bring healing to your life right now, even as you ask him. The next question we took a look at was the question, why are you so afraid? And this question was Jesus was asking the disciples while they were out on the Sea of Galilee in, in the midst of a storm. The, the storm had come up and Jesus at that time was asleep in the boat. And Peter and the other disciples was, were crying out in fear because they thought they were going to be swamped and woke Jesus up in a panic. And after sorting things out, he, he says to them, why are you so afraid? And then he calmed the ocean. Jesus asked them the question in the midst of the storm. And even before he calmed it, 
he was showing them that he was still in control of what was going on. Even though it didn't look like it, he was still in control. And you might feel even today that your storms, whatever they may be in your life, are way out of control, that nothing really makes sense, that there is perhaps a really big storm happening in your life at the moment. I want you to hear this. Jesus is right here. He's right there with you, in the boat with you, and he's in control. And he can be absolutely counted on 100% to walk you through and to help you through and come to the other side of all of what's going on. Whatever it is in your life that is your storm right at the moment, I ask you that you begin to place your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and know that he is in complete control. The next week we then looked at a question, do you still not understand? And even after all the evidence had been shared and presented to us, we do still have a tendency to try and justify scientific evidence over biblical evidence. And the only evidence that we can rely on really is the word of truth. This, this written word that we have, each, each of us I'm sure has a copy. If you don't, please get one. But it is the truth that we can rely on. Look around you, don't you see the sunrise or the sunset, the beauty in, in nature, the flowers, the, the delicacy of, of flowers and intricacies of insects and birds and the rainbows and the stars in the night sky. They all point to the glory and existence of a creator. Do you still not understand what's going on? And then in week six, we examined the question, are you also going to leave me? It was a question that Jesus point, put to the disciples after many walked away because it seemed that following Jesus was just too hard, too difficult. And even though there were many things for the disciples to question perhaps, they still came to the conclusion that it was in Jesus that they wanted to place their trust. And, they, and Peter made this great statement, where else would we go, Lord? Where else would we go? For you alone have the words of life. And I want to encourage you this morning that we to pray for one another, to uphold each other and encourage one another. Despite the effects that this virus is having on our community, on our nation and even worldwide, let us not give up meeting together. Although we may not be able to meet in person, we can meet virtually and, and perhaps there are other ways that you can connect with one another besides what we do on a Sunday. I pray today that you might use this as an opportunity to not give up meeting together, but pray for one another and encourage one another all the more as you see the day of the Lord approaching. And in a time of disruption and confusion, the question that we asked then was, what do the scriptures say? And this is a really good question. It's extremely relevant to us as society because these times should not cause us to doubt the word of God. In fact, the events that are happening are written down so that we might believe. John actually records that for us in John 20. He, he said this, These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And we need to know that the scripture, what the scriptures say so that we are able to give an answer according to truth and not something that we just think up out of our own mind, something that we think up and, and give and then have to retract it later because we weren't quite right or, or we were completely wrong. We took a look at the question after that that Jesus asked in the midst of a crowd and he says, who touched me? And it, it's, we saw the desperation and the determination of this timid woman who was so shy and isolated from society because of a bleeding problem that she had and she was changed at the moment that she reached out and touched the hem of Jesus' garment. So much so that she was able to testify and declare to the entire crowd of people that were there at the time of what had gone on in her life and the healing that had subsequently taken place. And I want to remind you even today that in the midst of your life, 
however busy it might be, in the hustle and bustle of life, that Jesus is right there. There is power available. And Jesus is right there wanting us to reach out to him. He's waiting for us. He has the power to heal and forgive. Then we put two questions together over last weekend, which was Easter. And the first question that Pastor Jasmine shared, why, why have you come? And then on Easter Sunday morning, we asked the question, do you, do you love me? Do you really love me? And I want to ask you those two same questions even today, because why, why are you here? Why are you listening to this today? What are you here for? Why have you come? And if, that's, if you're here for any reason, what are you looking for? Do you really love God? Do you really love him with the agape love that we talked about last Sunday? If not, that leads us directly into what the question is for today. And that question is, why did you doubt? And it comes at a time in Peter's life and the other disciples were with him, but it comes specifically for Peter. He seems to be almost the one that's, that the focus is on in this passage of Scripture. And he was called upon to display a faith in Jesus Christ that perhaps the others in the, in the boat at the time were unable to do. Again, it's set on the Sea of Galilee. Again, they're in a boat. Again, they seem to be in the middle of a storm. And it may be a familiar passage to many. But what happened on the Sea of Galilee that evening, the disciples were unable to forget ever after this moment in time. It was right after the feeding of the 5,000. It was at that time, and I want you to follow along as we read and pick up this passage from Matthew chapter 14. So follow along. It says, immediately... Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. And while he sent the multitude away, and then he had, when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up onto the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It's, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to, the water on you, to you on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those who were in the boat came and worshipped him saying, Truly you are the son of God. Okay, so once again, the disciples are crossing over the Sea of Galilee. And once again, it seems that they're in a storm. But this time, Jesus is not with them. Last time this happened, Jesus was asleep in the boat. But this time, they're on their own. He's not with them in the boat. And verse 22 says, Immediately after they had fed the 5,000, this is what it says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Do you see what just took place? Do you see that verse? As soon as the feeding of the 5,000 had finished, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. I wonder if any of them argued with Jesus. I wonder if any of them questioned him and said no, or why? After all, I'm sure that's what most of us would do. Jesus saying, get into the boat and cross over to the other side. My first response would be, why? Maybe even their conversation went something like that. The disciples are all packing up after the day of the 5,000, cleaning up. They're picking up the 12 basketfuls of, of leftovers that Jesus had asked them to do. And, and it was a big day. They'd been out in the sun all day. 
Jesus had been teaching and preaching and this amazing miracle had taken place. And I can just hear Jesus saying to his disciples, leave all this, just leave it alone, get into the boat and go across to the other side. I can already hear Peter saying, but no way, we're not leaving you. No way, we're not going without you. I can, I can almost hear Jesus getting a little stern and he's saying, no, I need you to go right now. I need you to get into the boat and cross over to the other side. And can you hear Peter? But what about you, Jesus? What about you? Why aren't you coming? Or, or we'll wait and help get you sorted out. And I can almost again hear Jesus saying, well, don't worry about me, Peter. Just get into the boat and go across to the other side. And I can picture the rest of the disciples questioning this in their own minds. They might not have said anything out loud, but you know they're thinking it's a little confusing. Why is Jesus not going to come? And reluctantly, they get into the boat and they leave without Jesus. I want to ask you a question. Do you think that Jesus was unaware of what was about to take place on the Sea of Galilee? Do you really think that Jesus had no clue that they were about to go through this storm that the scriptures describe as being contrary and need help? Of course he knew. Of course he knew. He had his entire group of people, his, the Jesus team, if you like, on this boat. He knew exactly what was going to take place. And that's why he had to make them go over on his own because he needed for them to, to learn something. He needed them to learn a lesson that could not be taught in any other way. Which brings me to the first point that I want to share with you today, and that is we can't avoid difficulties. It's, it's really not possible. We live in a world where difficulties will come up all the time. Difficulties are going to come into our life whether we like it or not. And Jesus never, never once said that if you put your trust in me, if you follow me with all of your heart, soul, mind and strength, that life is going to be so easy. He never once said that if you follow me with your heart, soul, mind and strength, that nothing is going to go wrong. I'll take care of all your problems. I'll make sure that you never sin. I'll make sure that you have an easy life. He never said that once. In fact, to the contrary, look what Jesus actually did say in John 16. He says, These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace, and in the world you will, underline the word will in your, your own scriptures if you're reading through, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. In this world, Jesus says, you will have tribulations. You will have trials. You will have problems. You will have difficulties, distress, suffering, pain, misfortune. They will happen to you. You're going to experience it whether you follow me or not. Where We are going to experience those things because they're what this world offers. And we are in this world. Does that sound like a life of easiness? Absolutely not. And that's why Jesus never said that I'm going to take it all away from you. He tells us that in this world, we are going to have those things. And in the reality is, we will experience those things in our life. Jesus didn't come to take away the problems of the world. But the scriptures tell us that he came that to give us peace as we go through those difficulties. Problems will be there. Struggles will arise. But we're not to give up because Jesus is there and to bring us peace as we go through. Not to bring us harm, not to cause us to be distracted and, and fall into a big heap. Jesus says, I've come that you might have peace. In this world, you will have problems, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. And in the midst of the problems and struggles, we can be at peace. Look back at the verse in John 16, and it says that even though this world we will have tribulations, I have spoken, says Jesus, these things, so that you might have peace. 
That sounds a little like an oxymoron, doesn't it? How can we have peace when everything around us is so much in upheaval? How much can we, how can we have so much peace if the turmoil of this world is, is like it is? When the media and those who are in authority over us are highlighting everything that is wrong and, and bringing a heightened state of panic to the community and the world that we live in. And that's the point, I think, that Jesus was trying to make. In this life, in this world, you will have problems, but you don't have to be worried about the problems because I can bring you peace through that. I believe that Jesus is wanting his disciples to understand, even at that point, that, and we need to understand that even though the world is in turmoil, even though peace and true peace seems such a, a far distant thing to be looking for, Jesus can bring it nevertheless because he's overcome the world. And Jesus Christ is in complete control of what is happening even now in this on this planet. You might think that or say that if he's in control, why have we got so many problems? Why is there so much sickness? Why is there so much hurt? Why is there so much pain? I want you to understand this. You need to understand this. If that's the question that you have, it was never God's desire that we experience life like we do. It was never his desire that we experience life like that. It was God's desire for us to live in communion with him, in fellowship with him. But man trusted in evil more than he trusted in good. Man placed his faith in evil, and so evil entered into the world. And, and the world became, the, 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 sorry, the, the God of this world was the God of evil. Satan, it tells us in the scriptures, is the God of this world and that he delights in destroying the God's presence and God's creation. Paul uses that language in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He says, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the eyes of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of Christ. And what Paul is saying is that Satan is the major influence on the ideals, on the opinions, on the goals and the hopes and the views of the majority of people who live in, the, in this world. His influence also encompasses and the world's philosophies, the world's education, the commerce, the commerce, the thoughts, the ideas, the speculations, and the false religions of the world are under his control. And they have sprung forth from lies which he put in place and deceptions that he is the master of. And because of that, it is impossible for us to avoid having difficulties in this life because we are part of that. But for those who place their faith in Jesus Christ, for those who place their hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, the scriptures tell us that he brings peace. And I would testify in my own life, and I'm sure there are many who would testify to that, he brings peace in the midst of turmoil. Despite what's going on, we can live in peace. And I challenge you even today that if you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, that you give him the chance to bring peace into your life right at this moment in time, that you take the opportunity today so that despite what is happening in your life, despite what is happening in the world around you, that you can have peace. Which brings me to the second point this, today, and that is difficulties are a test of faith. When Jesus made the disciples get into the boat, he was fully aware of the events that were going to take place. But he also knew that this was an opportunity to teach them or to give them an opportunity to show their faith. 
in the midst of a problem? What were they going to do when, when the wind started to rise up and they're out in the middle of the lake? What were they going to do? What was their response going to be? It was a way that Jesus was able to, to test or to evaluate their, their faithfulness in him. And so he allows them to go out on the boat without him, ahead into the impending wind that he knew was going to happen that would really test their faith. I want you to think about this for a moment. That do you think they were really in any kind of danger? Of course not. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew precisely the time that they were going to be needing him. They were never in any problems. But let me ask you another question. Do you think the disciples felt like they were in danger? I'm sure they did. And they probably wished Jesus was there. They were all out on the lake and the wind had, been, had come up for some time, maybe even before this time that we read about, and in, it's in the middle of the night. In fact, the, the scriptures tell us that it was the fourth watch. At that, for them, the, the Jews, they, ha, they have the nights broken up into watches, each about th- or three hours apiece. From 6 p.m. until 9 p.m. was the first watch. From 9 till midnight was the second. From midnight to 3 o'clock in the morning was the third watch. And the fourth watch, the fourth watch is what we're talking about, was from 3 a.m., through to 6 a.m. in the morning, very early in the morning, Jesus appears to them walking on the water. So this is really early. And it's unlikely, or it's likely that the disciples had been battling this wind for some time prior to the time that we are talking about right at this moment. They probably had had little to no sleep. They're tired, they're frustrated, they're scared, that's pretty obvious. And maybe just a little angry at Jesus because he'd sent them out on their own and he should be here. Where's Jesus when all this problem's about to take place? I can almost hear Peter again. It's usually Peter that I hear because I relate so well with him. But I, sh- we, I knew we shouldn't have left. I, why, where's Jesus in all of this? He's probably stuck somewhere in a comfy, warm bed, dreaming about sheep jumping over a lake somewhere and here we are sitting out in the middle of all this where is he it's his fault it's his fault we're in this predicament have you ever felt like that have you ever gone through a difficult situation and been so frustrated so angry so bitter that you've blamed God for the situation that you're in right now I'm sure most of us can relate to a time in our life where that's been the case. If you have, then take heart because this is for you. Look what happens. Jesus never allows us to go through difficulties on our own. Never. Jesus never allows us to go through difficulties on our own. But he does allow us to experience them because it not only builds our character and perseverance in our own life, but it will also reveal to us and perhaps to even to Jesus what we truly believe about God. When we face difficulties, our response to those difficulties reveals what we believe about him. It may well be a test of faith for us. How did God test Job's faith? If you've never read the book of Job, I want to encourage you at least read the first couple of, couple of chapters because it describes Job as this perfect man almost. And yet God allows things to happen in his life that are quite obscure. He loses everything. His property, his income, his children... Even his own health in the first round and the second round comes, follows on pretty quickly. But the thing is, in all of that, 
God does not allow anything to happen to Job except what God allows. Satan has no authority over Job, nor does Satan have any authority over those of us who are loved by God, who have called him by name to do anything except that which God allows. And so when we find ourselves in the midst of difficulties, when we find ourselves in the midst of problems, don't blame God for what's going on. Seek him, praise him, honor him that he thinks you worthy of being put into a position where you are, your t- faith is being tested because nothing will happen that God has not allowed to happen. And he's always in control even when we don't understand why. And when Jesus was going through his trial and his subsequent crucifixion, the desires of evil men were such that it seemed like they were victorious. We've killed Jesus. We've got rid of this blasphemous liar. Can you even hear the the rejoicing of those people who were so glad that Jesus was now once and for all done? The lies, the deception, the greed that was taking place in the world, it makes for a wonderful movie. And they were real for the people that were involved in it at the time. But despite that, what man intended for evil, God used for good. Jesus had to die. He used the evil nature of mankind to fulfill his purposes and his ways and the evil intent of mankind to bring about what he wanted done. Jesus did die, but Jesus needed to die so that we could overcome death and the power which held it over this earth. And that's what we're going to celebrate later on in today's service as we join together in Holy Communion. God is in control. And he allows difficulties into our lives. He is in control and he at times allows us and makes us even sometimes go through difficulties as a test of faith. But what happens if we fail that test? Because we all do which is the third point. Even when we fail, Jesus is there. The disciples were all alone, or or they thought they were all alone, battling the wind and, and the waves. And in the early hours of the morning, they're out there, they look up and they see this ghostly figure coming across the waves. Let me ask you, what would you have thought if you were in the boat with the disciples on that night? It's the early hours of the morning, you're tired, you're cold, you're frustrated, you're angry and scared and wet and out of control and suddenly you see this ghostly figure the scriptures to describe him as walking across the waves towards the boat don't tell me you're not scared because that's the experience i believe any one of us would have had no wonder they cried out in fear i would have too It, it wasn't a normal thing it just wasn't normal i don't know what they thought but I am sure they were, they were certainly not expecting Jesus to be the one out on the water that night. But then Jesus calls out. He says, it's I. Be of good cheer. What a crazy comment. Be of good cheer and look at the mess we're in. And you have to admire Peter's comment even here at the moment, his courage, because it was either courage or stupidity perhaps, but in the midst of all this, Peter, Jesus says, it's I, it's the Lord, be of good cheer. And Peter, in the midst of all this, cries out, says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out with you, to walk on the water. What was he thinking? Who would get out of a boat in the midst of this wind? And once, it, once again, it seems that Peter had spoken words before his brain had actually kicked into gear a little bit, but... The consequences, I don't know that Peter had really even thought through. And that was something he was renowned for. But Jesus says to him, come. He calls him out. And again, I don't know what happens at that point in time in Peter's mind, but 
At that moment, he, he begins to step out of the boat and he takes his first step on the water and he's walking towards Jesus on the water, the scriptures tell us. But as much as we like to criticize Peter for his lack of faith, he was the only one that took the step of getting out of the boat. There were 11 other disciples who were just as able to get out of the boat with Peter. Why didn't they all get out with Peter and walk on the water? So let's not be too critical of Peter's faith here because he steps out of the boat while the others have probably got their mouth covered with their mouth, uh, mouth covered with their hands and, and scared stiff of what's going on. And this is incredible. What's going on? Why would you get out of the boat, Peter? And Peter starts the walk. And just like Peter, Peter steps forward keeping his eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and begins the walk into the unknown. And for a while he walks on the water. For a while he takes the steps necessary. For a short moment his concentration is on Jesus, but it's not too long before the effects, the wind and the waves of, that are happening around him begin to distract him. And he turns his eyes away from the Lord Jesus Christ and onto the waves and onto the surroundings. The noise that is on the, across the water distracts Peter from, from watching Jesus. And Peter suddenly finds himself beginning to sink down. He focuses more on the waves than he does on Jesus. And look what the scriptures tell us in Matthew 14. But when he, that's Peter, saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And when he took his eyes off Jesus, he began to sink. And when he focused on what was going around him, he began to go down. But as he was going down, Peter did what every single one of us needs to hear and needs to do and needs to respond to, but we so often forget. And that is that when we're going down, when things are bustling up on top of us, when we're so crowded out by things, that we recognize that it's only Jesus who has the ability to save us. Lord, save me, is what Peter cried out. Why does it take us so long to call those three words when we're in the midst of a problem? In the midst of his failure, Jesus was there for Peter, and he reached out, and the scriptures tell us in Matthew 14, 31, immediately, immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. Two things I particularly want you to notice here. Firstly, that Peter knew he was in trouble. And when he knew he was in trouble and needed help, he, and sorry, when he knew he was in trouble, he needed help. And he was sinking. The second thing is that Peter knew who he could call on. He knew who he needed to call upon. And I don't know if you're going through any particular problems, struggles in your life at, no, at the moment, but I, and I don't know if those things are causing you to give up in your life at the moment either. You might feel like life is too heavy, that you're sinking a little bit into what's going on in your world. Perhaps everything that you thought was the secure has been taken away, undermined. That this pandemic that's resonating around the world has, has changed everything that what we thought was secure is now not so secure. The first thing any one of us need to do is to admit that we're in trouble and know that we need help. And while there may be help available to us in a worldly sense, for the things that really matter, the hard issues, I want to say to you that there is nothing that this world can offer to you that will really deal with the core heart issues. Nothing. You know you're in trouble deep down, and so you, the things of this world are not going to answer those questions, answer those problems. You know in your own heart that things are not okay. It might feel like it or seem like it to others on the outside, but you know inside that things are not okay, that you're not doing as well as what others seem to think you are. I want to say to you that through this event, that even though you might feel overwhelmed, that Jesus is right there. He's very near. 
And he's able, the scriptures told, told us already, to bring peace and contentment into your life at this moment in time. Perhaps you've called yourself a Christ follower and you're embarrassed to admit it, but this is the same thing that's happening to you right now. You too find the weight of the world is just too much and you're starting to crumble and, and you, maybe it's embarrassment and maybe it's something else, but for whatever reason, you, you don't want to say anything out loud. You've, you've had your eyes taken away from Jesus because of the distractions that have been going on. I want you to hear the same thing, that Jesus is near. He's right there. He's not oblivious to what's going on around you. He's right there. And Peter knew who he had to call upon. And maybe you haven't known who to call on in the past, but today I want you to hear this as well, that Jesus is the one that you can call on. He's the only one who can lift you up out of the miry clay. He's the only one who can put you back onto solid ground emotionally and spiritually. He is near and he's waiting for you to call out to him, Lord, save me. And Paul tells us in Romans 10, for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, he shall be saved. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Maybe you have never called upon the name of the Lord. It doesn't matter if you have or you haven't. The scriptures are still the same. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And maybe you failed the test of faith. Maybe you've started out on your walk with the Lord, but you failed the test because the things of this world got too heavy, too hard. I'm asking you today that you cry out to Jesus, that you call out to him, Lord, save me. And whatever you, you have done, I know that he will watch over you and he will help you and pull you back up. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. You may have failed the test, but Jesus is near. And that brings me to the question that Jesus asked. He stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Good question. Despite all the miracles that Peter and the other disciples had seen Jesus doing, despite knowing Jesus personally, Peter still failed. He'd never experienced him like this before. He'd never seen the power of God displayed in such a an amazing way that even the wind and the waves obey him. But Jesus clearly says to Peter, where is your faith? Trust me. Put your trust in me. Why did you doubt? In other words, don't you know by now, Peter, that I am able to do this? Don't you know who I am? And perhaps that's the question we need to ask ourselves. Do I know who Jesus is, the power that's available through him. And maybe there's some of you even listening in today and, and you're thinking, that's me. I, I've failed in the test. I, the things of this world are just so intense. I know I'm in trouble. Nothing I, I'm doing seems to be working. In fact, the more I do, the harder it gets. Can I ask that in the middle of what you're going through right now, have you taken your eyes off Jesus or have you even cast your eyes toward Jesus? Can I also remind you that despite what is happening around us right at this moment, we need to remember to keep what Hebrews 12 describes as looking unto Jesus, the author and perfect finisher of our faith, perfecter of our faith, who for the joy who was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let us fix our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He is near and he will hear. And finally, everything submits to his commands. Even after knowing this, even after coming to this point, I'm always, and, and knowing the ending to this story, I'm always amazed at how quickly the wind stopped. As it wasn't 
When they were walking back into the boat, it was when they got back into the boat that the wind stopped. And how quickly the, the disciples responded at this point. Because, So here's my question. What's our response when we see and experience the miraculous power of Jesus Christ in our own life? Many seem to go back to what they once did. We experience it, we're thankful, but we go back into doing what we always did. There are some who've experienced the hand of God on your life, and, and, but for one reason or other, you've given up on your first love. We talked about that on Easter Sunday morning. But for some reason or other, you've given up on that. And we spoke about that in many different other opportunities as well, that we everything submits to the commands of Jesus Christ. There's no problem too big. There's no problem too small. Then there's a children's song that goes something like this. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. There's nothing my God cannot do. And no matter where you are at the present time, no matter how bad you think you are and how bad you think things have been or you have been, no matter, no matter how rebellious you think you have been toward God, today he is waiting for you. Today he is near, waiting for you to call out to him, Lord, save me. When the wind and the waves and the, the life that we're going through gets so tall, he's waiting for it to reach out his hand so that he can pick you out of what you're going through right at this moment in time and bring peace into your life, even in the midst of the turmoil of this world. So what's your response? You know what the disciples' response was? Praise, worship, adoration. Verse 33 says, And those who were in the boat, that's the disciples, they came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Worship and acknowledge him as the Son of God. Worship him as the Lord of your life and follow him. And may you experience the peace of God which surpasses all understanding and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, Philippians 4 says, and it will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.